I'm really worried. Like, you know, when I start off on Fox as an anchor, it was 20, 2007, 2007. Then when I went solo as an anchor, it was 2010. And that was when I first started to lead discussions on things like this. And I remember back then, so that's 14 years ago, saying, what's going to happen when these, these narcissistic, know-nothing kids graduate college? And that back then we called them politically correct. Now they're woke. Uh, and go out into the world. And more and more we're seeing, well, they're going to get jobs at the universities and in corporate America, and they're going to change the fundamental fabric of the nation. They, they are, they're winning in pocket after pocket of American industry, and there's a whole slew of offspring coming up right behind them. Now, I will say as the mother of three children and who gets exposed to a lot of kids who are younger, right, I think it's going to end soon. I think they've lost the tail end of Gen Z and Gen Alpha. I really believe that. But that doesn't mean we're not going to have to deal with these kids for a good long while here in America. How do you guys see it? I mean, people, I think, naturally become more conservative as they get older. You know, our parents' generation, my my parents were hippies. My my mom went to Woodstock and, you know, she's still liberal, but she grew up to be a, a taxpaying non-revolutionary. I think the most people will follow that path. I mean, there it is clear, however, that these these uh these ideologies don't just stay on campus. Jesse and I have talked a lot about this on our show. They do enter the workplace, they do enter government, and they do get um, get sort of, uh, they become a part of the fabric of certain places. But I think this all, these things follow a cycle. They're, they're trendy and they won't be trendy always. Um, so I, I think that this is interesting. I don't think it is an existential threat. And in terms of these particular protests. I recommend people read Sorab Amari and Michael Powell on these protests. Both of them actually went to Columbia. And these are two people who I don't think would be a particularly sympathetic to, um, to the protesters. And they said, basically, you know, this is sort of cringe. It's a lot of land acknowledgments and it has sort of the ethos of an, of an HR department meeting of a, of an anti-racism training. Um, you know, it's the safe space of, of student protests. Um, there is anti-Semitism and bullying, and that's very concerning, and they should all disavow it, but they are exercising their right to free speech. And if they don't cross, and, and not all of them are crossing these lines, and as as people, as three people who have spent the last few years talking about our support of free speech, I think we need to 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 our, to support these protesters if they are not if they are not crossing certain lines. I mean, this, I think some people want to make this into sort of a, a chop Chaz 2.0, that autonomous zone in Seattle. Ugh. And it just, from the outside, it isn't that. Two, two teenagers were killed at chop Chaz. There were multiple rapes there. That was a lawless encampment. And this is contained on an Ivy League campus with gates. Um, so I find this more, frankly, amusing than I do um, scary. Threatening. I, yeah. I disagree yeah. with you. I, I had sympathy for the podcast, po the podcasters, the protesters, until you said they did land acknowledgement. So I <laughs> think they should be arrested uh, immediately. Um, yeah. No, the one point I want to make on the broader thing, we've discussed this on our podcast. I think Katie and I are in agreement that the peak of the craziness, whatever's going on now, is a moment of some craziness. But this it's thing springtime. we have. It's springtime, right? Exactly. You got to get outside. Got to get on the lawn. But but also you like do. just just a few years ago, one idiot's tweet storm could like end a celebrated author's career. Like publishers were terrified, media outlets were terrified. We've like passed the peak of a lot of that. It doesn't surprise me that some universities or small literary magazines are still dealing with that. But I think mostly the adults in the room have realized like for lack of a better cliche, you can't negotiate with terrorists and you can't, you can't just be constantly firing and canceling people. So I, I think a lot of things have improved, to be honest, as weird as it might be to say that today. I just feel like we can't be so, we're defensive when it comes to the issue of free speech for good reason. We've had our speech clipped and criticized and shut down, criticized is fine, but shut down and censored over and over and over for the past several years people who are more heterodox, as I know you guys are on certain issues and have faced so-called cancellation. But we can't be so defensive of the of you know the the right and the willingness and the principles behind free speech that we don't draw the line when someone actually has crossed it. I I also would allow the protesters, if I were running Columbia, I would allow them to go out and protest, to hold placards, to say, you know, the Intifada 
to say from the river to the sea. It's not great, but it, I don't think, I think half of them don't even know what it means. And I don't think, right, I don't interpret what river that you're from talking everybody. About. The Mississippi yeah. or? They well, don't know what river. They don't know. <laughs> I don't think they have any idea. It's like the girl we played a sound bite. She's like, I don't, I don't know what NYU has done. I don't know. I'm not sure why I'm here. I wish I were better educated. Okay. So, uh, but, you know, standing a lot in front of, of a NYU group of Jews say saying this is where the weapon should hit. Like saying right here, like they're, you're the next target of the, of Hamas weapons, these Jews right behind me. The human chains blocking Jews from getting on campus or going to class. What we saw elsewhere with them, the Jews having to lock themselves in a library and, and others banging on the door. Those, you're done, you're out. I'm sorry, you're suspended. You might be expelled depending on how bad it is. Like Vanderbilt, those guys who menaced a cop, you're expelled, goodbye. We don't need to talk anymore. And I, so I really think it's really not that hard. Why are we pretending it's all or nothing? Like they, they can protest, keep order, direct harassment of Jews based on their religion is a hard no under the law. So I just like, uh, I don't know. You guys are about nuance. Do you see it? I, I do. I mean, like, so you just had Heather McDonald on and, and for yeah. years people are trying to get her in trouble for saying controversial things. And I think for the sake of protecting everyone, you need to allow some pretty awful speech. So that's why I would set the bar high at a public university for what constitutes like harassment, harassment, like the kind of harassment you get punished for. And I, frankly, I would, I'm sorry, like I would put it higher. I think I'm agreeing with you on this, but like the intifada idiocy, I don't, I, I think you need to allow it. Um, if you're individually harassing a Jewish student or preventing them or any student, frankly, from getting somewhere, yeah, you can't physically prevent someone from moving around the campus. But I think generally speaking, we need to take a liberal stance on this and let people just scream themselves out, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. with Jesse on this. I mean, it really depends on where each individual draws the line. And the three of us would possibly get in trouble for saying other things, maybe things on on for disagreeing with some activist talking points on trans issues or things like that. And so I think to protect everybody, we really need to be as liberal as possible when it comes to this. I take my guidance from FIRE, the foundation for um, what yeah. is it, individual rights and, or, and expression now, and they're clear about this. Violence is a violence crosses the line. Discriminatory harassment crosses the line. And of course, the way you interpret that is it, de it depends on the individual case. But I, I think Jesse's right. The point of protecting free speech, inc it includes protecting odious speech. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Leo Grillo. Leo was on a road trip and came across a Doberman. This dog was severely underweight and clearly in trouble. Leo rescued the dog and named him Delta. Sadly, Delta was just one of many animals that needed help, and this inspired Leo to start Delta Rescue, the largest no-kill, care-for-life animal sanctuary in the world. They've rescued thousands of dogs, cats, and horses from the wilderness, and they provide their animals with shelter, love, safety, a home. April marks 45 years since Leo rescued Delta. Delta Rescue relies solely on contributions. If you would like caring for these animals to be part of your legacy, Speak with your estate planner because there are tax benefits here. You can grow your estate while letting your love for animals live well into the future. Check out the estate planning tab on their website to learn more and speak with your advisor. We call dog a man's best friend for a reason. You can help those who need it most. Visit deltarescue.org today to learn more. That's deltarescue.org. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.